Uh, my name is Kit Cabell. Welcome to Hard Lens Media. And we believe that third parties should have a voice. And joining us today is a candidate that's running for the United States Senate for the Green Party in the state of Maine, Lisa Savage. Lisa, thank you so much for joining Hard Lens Media. For our viewers and subscribers, can you give us a background to who you are and uh, what office or at least what U.S. Senate district you are running for in the state of Maine? Sure, Kit. Thanks for having me. Um, so my name's Lisa Savage, and I'm running against Susan Collins under ranked choice voting in Maine. Um, that it's not a district; it's a statewide election. Uh, thank you for, for, the this, for the U.S. That's fine. I live in the second district, but yeah. um, the senator is a statewide office, and. Um, I did, uh, I, I'm just retiring from a career teaching school. I'm a reading interventionist in a very uh, small rural uh, school in a very low income part of Maine. And I'm just finishing up that career, uh, retiring this year. And I've been an anti-war activist and organizer and also a client, especially with a focus on climate and militarism mm -hmm. organizer for many years here in Maine. And um, I, uh, became interested in running when the Green Party approached me this summer and said, hey, ranked choice voting, it's a game changer. You know, your name keeps coming up. Are you interested in doing this? The only elected office I've held before was that I was a vice president and chief negotiator of my union, the teacher's local bargaining unit for several years mm -hmm. in a row. And um, so I wasn't planning to run for elected office, but uh, Susan Collins has just been a terrible senator for us. And I don't have much faith in the Democratic Party either. So it was appealing under ranked choice voting to think about uh, what could be done. Mm -hmm. I started trying to get ballot access as a Green. I was a registered Green and I applied for ballot access. But the um, external uh, requirements in Maine are onerous for a third party. And uh, they we had to collect um, 2,000 registered green signatures during ice season mm -hmm. and be done by March 15th. And um, it, it just, it, 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 they make it impossible to do. So as we approached the deadline, we began to realize that we needed to try a different strategy. So like many green candidates before me, I unenrolled from the Green Party uh, so that I could gain ballot access as an independent candidate. So now instead of being main Green Independent Party, which is what the party's called in Maine. Now I'm a, a independent Green candidate, mm -hmm. and I did not change my platform or in any way my views. However, the ballot access rules became much easier. We got uh, over 9,000 signatures in one day on Super Tuesday, mm -hmm. um, and uh, and so we only needed 4,000 to get ballot access as an independent. Wow! So here I am. So first, I mean, again, this uh, this is a story that sounds uh, all too familiar. I mean, here in the state of Illinois, the Illinois Libertarians and Illinois Green Party were able to win a key uh, Illinois Supreme Court ruling where they're now, thanks, well, well, not thanks, but due to the situation of COVID-19, uh, they're able to have easy ballot access. But here in Illinois, uh, you need, to, if you're independent, green, or libertarian, you need about 25,000 signatures to secure yourself, plus another 25,000 because, well, signatures end up missing. So um, I'm, I would like you to elaborate a little bit more on the ranked choice voting because it seems like there, there's, there's a better chance for third parties to really get recognized by voters and people to really embrace that more. But are you concerned about any kind of a joint pushback against you by the DNC or the RNC? Because when it comes down to third parties, they don't want them to really be on the ballot or actually win any kind of seat of power. Case in point, when Ginger Jensen, who was running for a city councilwoman seat in Minnesota, most of the establishment or candidates basically rallied around together so that the socialist alternative candidate wouldn't get on the ballot or actually wouldn't win, or win the election. Are you, has there been any kind of like joint effort from the establishment to push you off the ballot or at least push voters away from you? Uh, not that I'm aware of other than they just completely ignore me and they ignore ranked choice voting like it's going to go away if they don't say the words. We've had it now for a couple of years in Maine. It already unseated a very unpopular conservative incumbent in the second district where I lived the last congressional election, um, Bruce Poliquin, who you might know because he was kind of famous for hiding out in the ladies room when a journalist approached him. Um, he was just a Wall Street, terrible, terrible <laughs> representative for this part of Maine. And um, there were two independents on that ranked choice ballot, as well as a, a, 
Democrat, Jared Golden, and because of ranked choice voting, the way it works in Maine is this. So there were four candidates on the ballot that time. And the two independents polled pretty well, uh, but one of them came in last. So the Secretary of State strikes that name from the ballot and then looks at, okay, people who picked that candidate as their first choice, who did they pick as their second choice? And then those votes are transferred to the candidates they picked. And that happened, they did another round of it. So until someone gets a majority of the votes, the election is not over. If in the first round, one candidate gets a majority of the votes then the election is over and ranked choice voting doesn't really kick in. Um, one of the, uh, misunderstandings that people have about ranked choice voting is they're like, well, I don't want to have to vote for Susan Collins. Well, you don't have to vote. You don't have to rank all the candidates on the ballot. You could just vote for one like you customarily have and, and leave it at that. Um, but it can be a you know pretty significant uh, game changer, I think. Susan Collins is the most unpopular senator in the U.S. for many good reasons. So she's vulnerable. <laughs> and then the Democratic Party, they have a... Um, a very progressive, couple of very progressive candidates running the primaries uh, July 14th. And, um, but they have given every indication that they are nominating a very centrist, very corporate Democrat. Um, and uh, many of the supporters, especially the young people that support the more progressive candidate, I don't think will follow it, you know, into the fold and vote for the corporate Democrat. So I think I can probably pick up a lot of number one votes from that group when they become disappointed by the Democratic Party machine so, yet again. And then the other thing is someone who votes number one for me is very unlikely to rank Susan Collins number two. And someone who votes for the Democrat number one is very unlikely to rank Susan Collins number two. So the number two votes could be quite significant. So I think it's important because you, you're talking about there's some progressive candidates that are right now running in their own primary. Um, there, there's talk about them supporting a centrist candidate. So the thing is, um, we, we saw that firsthand with the presidential election right now, or at least for the Democratic primary, to be more precise, where sure. you know Ber uh, Bernie Sanders is trying to tell his supporters or telling Biden that you know you should start courting my supporters. So vice versa, if that's the same scenario that's going to happen in the state of Maine. What is your campaign's outreach to these uh, to, to the youth vote, to independent voters, to progressive voters that probably have never considered voting third party? What is what is right now your your ground plan? Are you holding town halls or at least digital town halls or any kind of uh, Q and A sessions to where you can do a real outreach to these people who perhaps might not consider voting third party? Sure, we have uh, Zoom meetings every day of the week. Um, we have a big volunteer network. That's how we got over 9,000 signatures in one day. Um, most of those volunteers are young people. Um, they either are students or um, you know young working people. And um, our platform and Bernie's platform is very similar. You know, I'm in favor of Medicare for all, a demilitarized Green New Deal, ending student debt, guaranteed $15 waged, you know, immigration reform, get the kids out of the concentration camps at the southern border. So it's not hard to appeal to uh, to Bernie type voters with our platform. It's very, very similar. Some of the things we've done is, you know, create graphics showing how our uh, platforms line up. The other thing is that the two corporate candidates have raised m tens of millions of dollars already outside of Maine. And this is a grassroots campaign. It's like any green campaign, most of our donors are just regular working people. Mm -hmm. Many of the donations that come in are, uh, you know, fairly small amounts. And um, we do more with less. We have a very, uh, very dedicated team, but not a lot of paid staff. Many of the people on our team that have worked the hardest are uh, dedicated greens from years gone by who say things like, I've waited all my life for this campaign. This is the one we can win. We could actually put a green in the U.S. Senate. Um, and we have a lot of creative energy on our team, luckily. Um, Maine is a very artistic state. A lot of, a lot of artists sell here. And um, we're about to have an art auction as a fundraiser because so many artists support the campaign and we're willing to donate a piece uh, to a fundraiser. So um, I think that we will be able to break through a lot of the, you know, as you could guess, there's just a barrage of advertising already mm -hmm. for the two corporate candidates. And 
really people in Maine don't like that kind of hard sell very much. The Maine electorate is very independent. The biggest party affiliation in Maine is unenrolled, meaning no party affiliation. Okay. And people switch parties to vote in a primary or, you know, switch their registration. And we already have one independent senator. Uh, senator Angus King is an independent and he was governor of Maine for two terms as an independent. So it's it's not unusual for Mainers to, to elect an independent. So I think it's also important to bring up, too, about um, non-voters and perhaps people paying attention to debates. Um, have you secured yourself to be on the debate stage as well against the RNC and DNC candidates? I haven't, but I think until the primary is over, there won't be debates. I, there haven't been any debates so far. Obviously, we're dealing with the pandemic like everyone right. else. Um, you know, some journalists that are friendly to our cause have said, I bet you, Lisa, we'll get into the debates. For one thing, Maine usually does include the independent candidates. And, um, you know, if she's the only other one that makes it onto the ballot, they're not going to be able to exclude her, especially with a ranked choice voting race. Okay. So I think it's also important because I, I bring this up to all third party candidates, whether they're green, libertarian, socialist, or non affiliate. Um, mm -hmm. There is a potential scenario, let's put the scenario out there, where you win your election and you are now in the United States Senate. What are you prepared to do in order to help the Green Party consolidate and maintain power so it still has at least a, an option for, for voters to go to? Because at this point, we're stuck with this two-party system. What are you prepared to do to help build and maintain power for the Green Party so it can continue on past this election cycle but be more of a force in uh, election cycles in the future? Well, I certainly think that we need to work to get money out of politics. You know, it's not supposed to be an auction. Mm -hmm. And we have the government uh, policies and the situation uh, that we're in right now with the climate crisis and with the uh, pandemic being so badly mishandled. That's what happens when you auction off these seats to the highest bidder. So I think, you know, sharply reducing the effect of money on uh, campaigning and, and making it so that an ordinary teacher, working class person could actually run for office. Maine has a clean elections law. Unfortunately, my this race doesn't qualify for the clean elections law, but Maine has been a leader in uh, you know getting money out of politics and um, elections reforms like ranked choice voting. I would love to see ranked choice voting uh, at the national level. Um, many municipalities have it. I'm sure you know New York City adopted it recently. The uh, city of Portland, biggest city in Maine, adopted it. San Francisco, Berkeley, I think Minneapolis. So it's not really that unusual of, of an idea. The two corporate parties will resist it because they want to push the false dichotomy narrative on us. Um, but I think that most people that understand ranked choice voting say, hey, yeah, that does get more voices and more choices and you end up with the the uh, the winning candidate more uh, closely represents the consensus of the voters about what kind of policies are we looking for. All right, all right, that's uh, it's a very interesting perspective, and uh, th there is a potential chance that maybe you can win this election. I think it's uh, important that people start looking past a two-party system. So before we start talking to you about policy, uh, let's talk about the current incumbent real quick. Uh, there, uh, let's talk about Susan Collins and her history in regards to representing Maine in the United States Senate. Uh, could you care to elaborate to our viewers and subscribers uh, what she has done so far and perhaps why she should be voted out of office? Sure. Uh, Susan Collins has had a reputation for many years in Maine for being um, kind of centrist, uh, a Republican, but not extreme in the past. And I've never voted for her, but I know, you know, teachers that I've uh, worked with that were Democrats have voted for her because of two main reasons. One was that she could be counted on to vote correctly on women's reproductive health rights. And she could be counted on to vote correctly for uh, children's health issues or, or any or education, things that benefited children. So she really had the women of Maine in her court as, OK, we can count on her for that kind of vote. Um, when she um, upheld, uh, you know, or, or made it possible for Brett Kavanaugh to ascend to the Supreme Court, most women across the country said, done with her. 
And in when we were uh, collecting signatures, the quickest way to get a couple that was walking by you on the sidewalk to say, hey, would you like to sign? All you had to say was running against Susan Collins. And when you said the word Susan Collins, the woman at least head would whip around. She'd say, what? You're running against Susan Collins? Where do I sign? So uh, Kavanaugh was the beginning of the end for Senator Collins. Uh, next, actually, interestingly, prior to that, um, I had a... Uh, house meeting, a, a Zoom house party with some retired postal workers from the Bangor area, so now, or another uh, city in Maine, and they have been angry at Senator Collins since 2006 when she authored the legislation that undercut the financial stability of the U.S. Postal Service. Mm -hmm. You know, that was a deliberate attack on their financial viability by uh, forcing them to fund their pension out 75 years, which no one else has to do. And they remembered that. So that was really interesting because that certainly predated uh, the Kavanaugh thing. But since Kavanaugh, uh, the Republican tax bill that, that robbed from the poor and gave to the rich, very unpopular here in Maine, um, then the impeachment debacle was not good for Senator Collins at all. Mm -hmm. You know, she always tries to play both sides of the field and she always says she's not going to say how she votes. But really, since the current administration came in in Washington, D.C., she has absolutely towed the party line. You know, most recently um, under the pandemic conditions, Maine is already a very low income state with not many jobs and people do not have usually a, much of a buffer between them and economic disaster. And, you know, how many bailouts for the big corporations, her big corporate donors have we had already? And the people, I don't know about you, I'm still waiting for my stimulus check, my one stimulus check. So mm -hmm. the people of Maine are not fooled anymore by thinking that they could count on Susan Collins to represent their interests. So I think we also have to address uh, just a few things in regards towards um, what a third party candidate can do. And, you know, there's, there's a lot of people who want to demand more from the United States Senate and the House. And right now we're seeing how the corporations right now just basically got bailed out. They're being taken care of and the working class are just left holding the bag. So um, at this point right now, uh, where do you stand on, uh, I'm just gonna mention some key issues and you can elaborate more on your policies, but let's talk about climate change because that's something that a lot of people are choosing to ignore corporations and the large fossil fuel industries are basically given a green light. Uh, we've covered on earlier reports of how basically the Trump administration is basically removing all restrictions away from big fossil. What is your plan to really introduce green technologies, green initiatives um, in the United States Senate? Where do you stand on this? Well, I do think that a demilitarized Green New Deal is the key here. I say demilitarized because you know, the Pentagon is the biggest green, uh, consumer of fossil fuels of any institution or organization on the planet. Mm -hmm. If it were a nation and it were listed with other nations in terms of how many, how much greenhouse gas it emits each year, there are 140 nations that emit less greenhouse gas than just the Pentagon does. Um, so anytime we spend, you know, the federal budget shows us spending about 54% of the discretionary budget, in other words, what Congress can spend each year on the Pentagon at this point. But that is a false figure. Really, uh, all the nuclear weapons uh, development and, and construction is hidden in the energy budget. Also, the Veterans Administration is its own budget line. I'm not in any way in favor of not taking care of veterans. I think that's extremely important. But I do think that to get a fair price tag for America's, you know, military department of the military, you have to include that figure as well. If you do include both those things, it's more like 70% of the mm -hmm. discretionary budget each year is going to the military. So if you stop building weapon systems, that is a one that's immediate win for the climate because the war machine is very, very hard on the climate, very bad for the climate. Right. Under the um, Kyoto protocols, the military was exempted from being counted because the Earth's atmosphere is so patriotic. Why would it count our greenhouse gas emissions if they're you know, coming from military planes? Um, right. It's absurd. Paris Accords um, fixed that a little bit, like made it optional to mm -hmm. count. But you know, again, it's the difference between science and politics you know, uh, the science is that greenhouse gas emissions are, are driving climate change. 
if you then take that weapons factory and you make something that uh, helps the climate crisis, mm. um, a, a kind of a clean energy system or a train system, Maine really has no public transportation to speak of. We're in our cars all the time driving to get anywhere. If you do something that actually addresses the climate crisis, then now you have a win-win for climate. Um, and I also feel that any part of any Green New Deal generates jobs. You need a just transition. I don't want to throw anybody out of work. Um, General Dynamics owns the Bath Iron Works shipyard that runs on Navy contracts only, building warships. But um, it's a big employer in Maine, and they're good union jobs that you could actually, you know, with benefits that you could live on. Um, but economist research shows that if you invested the same amount of money in building clean energy systems, you would generate 50% more jobs. So instead of having, you know, 6,000 jobs, you'd have 9,000 jobs. Um, so that's a win too. And I think part of any Green New Deal um, that I've heard that I, that I think would really turn the corner on climate crisis would also be investing in locally generated energy, like consumer owned utilities that not only generate the energy there, but you use the energy where it's generated. And the consumers are the ones that make the decisions about what to do. Mm -hmm. um, right now we have in Maine, an electric utility that's owned by a multinational based in Spain, that's trying to cut down the Maine woods to rent a transmission line from Quebec on our Northern border to uh, Boston, uh, you know, down in Massachusetts, um, so that they can make millions of dollars off that is very inefficient. You lose a lot of energy transmitting it over, you know, thousands of miles like that. And there's really no benefit to Maine. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that a Green New Deal really needs to include, um, you know, turning our utilities into consumer owned and operated um, entities because people make wise decisions about their own needs um, and, and selling it off to the highest bidder does not get us a sound um, energy policy. All right. And, and now moving on to another thing, too, because you mentioned about the Green New Deal and economics and how uh, utilities should be owned by the people. Um, I, I'd like you to at least give your opinion on UBI, because at this point right now, unemployment um, is extremely antiquated all across this country. There's a lot of people who have filed for unemployment, but yet they're still not getting access to it. And there's now a lot of talk about embracing UBI. Where do you stand on a universal basic income? And what would you do to improve it? Are you for it? Are you against it? Uh, could you elaborate on that? I am definitely for it. I think that all the other wealthy countries in this pandemic um, have provided, they may not be calling it UBI, but essentially they have stepped up and said, we're sending every adult in the country $2,000 a month until you know we can get back to work and get past this. Um, the United States stands alone, supposedly the wealthiest nation in the world, and not supplying people with a universal basic income that they can count on. Um, one third of people failed to make their rent payment April 1st. I haven't seen the figures for May 1st, but I would imagine it's even worse. And as you pointed out, people are unemployed. They've lost their health insurance because of that. How are they supposed to make COBRA payments without any income? So universal basic income is a good idea. And I'm, uh, I'm not uh, very conversant on all the details of how it would exactly work. But I, when I look at the other wealthy nations and the way that they take care of their people, mm -hmm. it seems clear that the United States is woefully far behind in that regard. You know, I've been a school teacher and most recently a school teacher of young children. I was a reading interventionist at an elementary school. Mm -hmm. It really impacts the ability of children to learn, to learn to read, to learn anything when their family is hungry, uh, gets evicted, um, is living without heat or mm -hmm. hot water in mm -hmm. the main winter. These are learning issues and any a wealthy society would want to invest in young people. Another thing that I think is, is pretty crazy, it's not exactly UBI, but why are we making people come out of state universities? So they're going to public higher education and they're coming out with tens of thousands of dollars of debt. Mm -hmm. a, a wealthy society should want to educate the, the young people that want to go you know, into that uh, post-secondary education. We need doctors. We need engineers. We need teachers. Why would we? Why would we make people drag debt through their life for decades after uh, going to a public university? It's just crazy. 
It, it is madness. So I, so I guess right off the bat, you are for student debt forgiveness. Uh, is that a correct? Yes, I really uh, think that the student debt is not only hurting the individuals who are carrying that debt, it's hurting us as a society. At the age that I was exiting college with a modest amount of debt, I was a scholarship student. I came out with, you know, a little bit of debt. I was still able to get on with my life, you know, uh, take a job that was meaningful to me rather than just whoever was paying the most or, you know, start a family, uh, build a house. Young people today can't do any of those things. They're working like two jobs or three jobs and still living with their parents just to make their student loan payments. That is not good for society as a whole, I don't believe. Now, you also talked about how uh, other countries across the world right now are taking care of their citizens. And once again, the United States, well, at least according to people like Joe Biden and Nancy Pelosi, they believe that something like COBRA is just fine. Uh, or if we improve the Affordable Care Act, also known as Obamacare, also known as Romney Care, um, that'll be just fine for Americans. But I think right now a lot of people are open to the idea of a single payer health care system, Medicare for all. Um, there's a chance where you could possibly be elected into the United States Senate. Uh, what are you prepared to do to fight for Medicare for all? Is this an issue that you believe in? Are you, uh, or do you have a different version of it? Could you elaborate for our viewers and subscribers? Um, I absolutely am in favor of Medicare for all, and I will fight for it. Um, a universal single payer system. It doesn't have to be Medicare for all, but I feel like we're in an emergency now. There's not, it's not a good time to scrap everything and start over. Might there be a better system of universal health care than Medicare? Maybe, but Medicare is already in place. It's already working. It exists. Expanding that to cover more people would be a, a very pragmatic response to a public health crisis that um, we have mishandled badly. One of the issues is, you know, tying your uh, health care, your health insurance to your job is ridiculous because then you lose your job and, and what you suddenly don't need health care anymore. COBRA is fantastically expensive if you've ever looked into it. And putting the taxpayers on the hook to pay COBRA doesn't really solve the problem either. It solves the problem for those health insurance companies where the, the CEOs make $20 million a year, but it doesn't solve you know, the problem for a, a family. What we actually need is health care. I'm one of those people that doesn't think that the word profit and the words healthcare belong in the same sentence together. Not every human endeavor is appropriate to involve the profit motive and health is would be right at the top of the list. The other thing that I think the pandemic has really exposed is how dangerous it is to not have a national healthcare system that can uh, plan and execute a response to something like an unprecedented, uh, you know, novel coronavirus pandemic that um, really requires pretty coordinated efforts, especially in a country this large. And we have seen a complete lack of coordinated efforts. The profit motive has been introduced into basically every level of response to the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And the federal government has kind of said to the states, well, you're on your own, you know, do your best. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the U.S. can do a lot better than that at protecting our public health. All right, and I think I just want to ask two short questions. Um, number now, we've talked about your your stance on UBI, a Green New Deal, climate change, uh, third party ranked choice voting, and numerous other issues. But let's also talk about money and politics real quick. Where do you stand on uh, Supreme Court rulings of Citizens United as well as McCutcheon's decision, where money is speech and corporations are people? Yes, uh, Citizens United was an extremely bad um, ruling by the Supreme Court. Um, when the when the judiciary, the highest level of you know the federal level judiciary becomes politicized, then you have lost any semblance of checks and balances where one branch of government can kind of you know uh, reel people back from the edge of the cliff if one branch of government is out of control. Um, the the absurd notion that corporations are people and that money is. Uh, free speech protected by the First Amendment, you know, that's just idiotic. All it really did was open the door to, um, you know, even more influence of lobbyists and corporations in Congress. As a Green Party candidate, I pledge to neither accept nor solicit mm -hmm. donations from either 
corporate executives, corporate lobbyists, or the super PACs that launder corporate uh, donations so that candidates can falsely claim they don't take corporate money. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm never going to raise the kind of money that my uh, you know, Democratic and Republican opponents have already raised. Um, it, it just isn't possible to raise tens of millions of dollars uh, and not be beholden to the corporations and the individuals that gave you that kind of money. Okay. You're go- they're going to own you and they're going to set your agenda. So I would enter the U.S. Senate without those ties on me. Um, I would enter the U.S. Senate with the support of hundreds of people who trusted me to faithfully, you know, be a represent them and be their voice. All right. And then a uh, final question for our viewers and subscribers, uh, in case you want to learn more about your campaign, find you online and on social media, where can they go? Because at this point, uh, we should all be supporting third parties. At least I'm going to speak for myself. I believe that we should have a true parliamentary system and have uh, different perspectives, a multi-party system. Where can people find you online and on social media in case they want to help you out? Thanks, Kit. Um, so Lisa for Maine mm-hmm. is the name of our uh, website. It's spelled out F-O-R and Maine has an E on the end dot org. Mm-hmm. That's our campaign website. And you can sign up to volunteer there. Uh, you could donate there and you can also see what we're up to. As I mentioned, we're having an art auction this week and there's a link to that on the on the website. Um, that website is Lisa for Maine dot A-R-T, which mm-hmm. I didn't even know could be a URL, um, okay. but all of our social media accounts as well. Um, Facebook, I think Facebook is Lisa Savage for U.S. Senate, but like, you know, the handle is at Lisa for Maine. Twitter is at Lisa for Maine. Instagram is at Lisa for Maine. Mm-hmm. So uh, it's pretty easy to find us. And we welcome, we have volunteers in the United Kingdom. We have volunteers in Mexico. We have volunteers on the West Coast. And we have a lot of volunteers in our own state too. Many people see this as a kind of flagship um, campaign that they would love to see succeed. So, you know, we'd love to have anyone on the team that feels that way. Well, uh, it would be very historic if we actually see somebody from a third party actually win a seat in the United States Senate. And uh, if that is the chance, uh, if that, or if that is the case, uh, we would definitely like to do a follow-up interview with you uh, on our show in case that's a, a likely scenario that that is to happen. So nonetheless, Lisa Savage, thank you so much for joining Heartlands Media. She is running for the United States uh, Senate in the state of Maine for the Green Party. Thank you so much for joining us, and uh, we do appreciate uh, you being on our show. And then as a final note to all our viewers and subscribers, thank you so much for joining Hard Lens Media. Um, We are live every Monday through Friday at 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 3 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, and 5 p.m. Central Standard Time for all our friends in the Midwest. I'm Kit Cabello with Hard Lens Media. Peace to you guys, and let us all do what we can to build a better future.